afternoon. My name is uh, Selma de Mink. I uh, recently started a group in Amsterdam. We might have openings for postdocs uh, and some PhD students. Some of you are a little too senior for that. But uh, <laughs> on the observational side and on the theory side, it's not certain yet, but uh, keep us in mind if you think this is exciting. Uh, progenitors, I'm interpreting this a little bit lightly, uh, uh, um, uh, freely. Uh, We're in the supernova section. Uh, I'm going to talk about things that make a Newton star a black hole or two, uh, because that's the more exciting and uh, fun these days. Uh, so the first part, I want to do two things. So in the first part, I want to give you a, a little tour of uh, how wildly varied uh, progenitors can look like, uh, just to put all the theorists uh, that think about stars, at least, uh, on the wrong feet uh, of uh, how complex these things are. And in the second part, if I get to it, I want to discuss a little bit uh, our attempts to go towards a more um, uh, a model framework where we can uh, interpret in a statistical way, but accounting for some of the complexities, mostly binary. So the theme of this talk is uh, binaries, of course. Uh, let me take you on a safari to uh, this region, 50 uh, kiloparsecs south, roughly. Uh, this is 30 Doradus, the nearest starburst region where we can actually individually study uh, progenitors in action while they're still innocently waiting to, to explode. Um, most are uh, between uh, maybe 2 million years and, and, and 20, 30 million years old. So they have like 10 to 30 million years to go before they explode. Maybe a few explosions happened already. There's a supernova uh, remnant at least there in the south. So a few might have happened there. But it's very young. And so it's full of uh, the most crazy progenitors that we don't fully know how to model. To start with, I think this is the most exotic monsters we have. Uh, in the very center, there's four stars with masses of uh, probably above 150 solar masses and nine in total with masses over 100 solar masses. So this is a paper that uh, we uh, had out uh, uh, in February. Uh, HST data, um, I'm not the observer here, so, uh, but Paul Crowther is the one uh, leading this in Saida Caballero Nieves. Uh, here you see an HR diagram uh, showing different tracks and each point is uh, some of the, uh, these stars in this region. Does this work? Yes. So up here, these things are pretty crazy. We can discuss the error bars on this. Uh, the first four were out of there already. What is new about this paper is that the spectra are much better and we have nine of these stars in the upper part here. So these are not just outliers. This, this works for a relatively normal IMF. What are these going to end up like? We don't know. The mass loss rates are not well enough determined for these stars. At slightly lower metallicity, my bet would be a parent stability supernova. Here, the, the, the story is still open. Uh, the interesting part here, this papers that are still in production, is these guys here. It's the youngest massive stars that we uh, see that have not done anything yet, and uh, it's full of binaries, but that's a paper that we're still working on. Uh, let's go on on our tour. Uh, it's full of binaries, this region. Not th only this region, any region with massive stars is full of binaries. Uh, that is no news, we always knew that. Uh, but what is relatively new insight is that the majority of these binaries are so close that they will go through a phase like that during their evolution, completely changing the structure and properties of both stars. So one might be stripped and not have any hydrogen left anymore at the moment it explodes. Uh, and so the, the uh, in 2012, we published this for a galactic sample. And what we're trying to do now is to see how universal this, are these results. And we see high binary fractions everywhere. Small variations, but so far within statistics. And so here you see, for example, the observed distribution of periods. It's a commutative distribution, so periods between one day and a thousand days. Up to 3,000 days, you can have severe interaction in a binary system. So all these binaries will have severe interaction. These surveys are slightly different in selection effects and setup, but you see all of these surveys have a lot of uh, preference for very short period binary systems. Uh, then. Oh, so it's full of runaway stars, stars that are not staying in the place where they're born, but they're moving away with at least 30 kilometers a second or so, or, or three sigma away from the dispersion of the cluster. And so the most uh, interesting beast is somewhere on the side of this cluster, around one of these here. And so it's an 80 solar mass runaway star. So 80 solar mass, why does an 80 solar mass star decide to suddenly fly out of the region where, where it was born? Uh, we're not sure, but one of the hypotheses is that it's actually kicked out of the central star cluster. And so then that probably happened by a collision, near collision between a binary system and a third star, a three-body interaction. And so it's typically the least massive star being shot out. And so this being 80 solar masses is also evidence for this uh, central star cluster to be full of, of monster stars, if you want. There's a second way to make uh, runaway stars, and that is if you're in a binary system and one of the stars explodes as a supernova. 
that's probably not enough. It probably also needs a kick. The compact object needs to be born as a, uh, with a kick. Otherwise, it's hard to unbind the system. But for the first time, we have 20 runaway stars. Maybe that doesn't sound like a high number to you, but it's for the first time that we also know the star formation history, and we can really couple this back. And so with one of my students, I'm trying to infer what this is telling us about uh, the kicks of these uh, objects, which is uh, exciting. Uh, but uh, more about that uh, in half a year, maybe. Then, there's a couple of stars that are spinning extremely fast. We see them with all kinds of rotation rates. Actually, the most surprising is how many slow rotators there are. The large majority of these stars are not rotating faster than, say, 20, 25 percent of their Keplerian maximum. That's not what you expect. A star formation, if you start with a star forming cloud, you have orders of magnitudes, uh, too much angular momentum. If you would put that in a star, naively you would say, well, it will solve it one way or another, but you probably have stars that break up when they're born. Extremely young stars, most of them are rotating slowly. But some are rotating extremely fast, and so one of these ex extreme beasts is here on the side here, and we think it's one of these systems that might have been produced in a binary system because it's also a runaway star. This is the record holder. It's rotating so fast, it's 600 kilometers a second at the surface with a big arrow bar. But, um, um, and so that's so fast that material at the equator is no longer bowed and probably flung into a disk. This is a classical BE star you might recognize. It is an OE star, a massive version of it. Uh, and why are we so excited about rotating stars? Because on the theory side, we think that rotation is really changing how stars evolve if they're rotating that fast. And, and so I'm showing here an uh, HR diagram of evolutionary tracks of normal stars, as you may be used to them. And so they, they nicely start here, burning hydrogen, and over time they evolve, become redder and bigger, at least at uh, low metallicity. If they're rotating very, very fast, so not, not just 25%, but really fast, and this is what is happening. These stars evolve in the wrong direction of this diagram, if you believe these models, right? This is, we're, we're, we're doing a theory of stellar evolution here, so it's good to uh, keep that in mind. Um, so this is uh, uh, not new results in 89. Maidair already saw that some of his models were rotating so fast that he got this type of evolution. And so it's actually one of the simple analytic solutions that, that we had for stellar evolutionary structure before we could actually solve the equations. Because if you fully mix the stars, they nicely follow so-called homology relations. And that is what is happening here. These stars get brighter while they're becoming more and more helium rich, and then they contract and become extremely hot. And this has been very exciting. Uh, uh, several people, including also um, uh, Stan and uh, Alex Hager, but also Sung Chil Yoon have been proposing that this makes uh, progenitors that are fast spinning and helium rich and potential progenitors for long gamma ray bursts um, with uh, enough questions as well. And then the last one, uh, I want to talk about this one. This uh, is a binary system. Uh, this is, so, so binaries are not exotic, they're everywhere, but this one is exotic. This is the most massive over contact system. We had a very nice ESA press release, so this is of course the artist impression you see here. If you wonder if that's flaring, yes, they put the solar model on, over on top of the, the 3D wash slope that we gave them. Uh, but it looks pretty, there's a movie of it, I'll show it in the end if you'd like. Uh, two stars of 30 solar masses, this is the deepest and hottest over contact binary. And so I was very excited when we found this. Uh, in my thesis I had been thinking about these uh, uh, systems that are very close to contact. And so these stars are very deformed. And a bit similar to rotating stars, we think that that triggers instabilities in the interior and can probably drive large-scale circulations. As soon as your star is not spherical anymore, the equal potential surfaces uh, are no longer uh, 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 nicely round. And so near the equators, uh, the star will, sorry, near the pole, the star will be hotter, and near the equator will be cooler, and this drives large-scale circulations. And so there may be other ways in which you can drive interior mixing processes. And so if you mix them well enough, and in our initial models, uh, 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 at least we, we got enough mixing, then these stars also evolve homogeneous. And so homogeneous means that the stars don't expand, as I showed you before briefly, but the stars shrink. So we have two stars touching, and you would think that these two stars would smell together and make one big star soon, but if they're mixed well enough, they would actually shrink within the orbit, stay very massive, you have some winds, but uh, you get very massive helium stars, and we have large trouble to explode those, and they probably form and make two massive black holes. And so uh, last year we got a bit excited. It seemed very speculative to think about this, uh, but you very naturally make two massive black holes uh, at relatively short periods. And so we started these computations, uh, and so this would be a different way to make uh, two black holes in such a short period that uh, the typical merger time for such a system would be roughly 4 to 11 million giga years. 
And so that is great because if you do that somewhere out in the universe at a redshift, uh, what would it be? Well, uh, four-ish or so or beyond, um, then these systems would merge relatively close to uh, today and we would observe them with uh, LIGO. Um, uh, we were uh, not very fast with this. We weren't fully finished and at some point rumors started to appear and uh, we realized we had to uh, advance a little. Uh, at that point, my collaborator Ili Mandel was inside and he knew everything and I didn't know anything. Uh, that was a very interesting way to write a paper. It's not the best way to... Uh, anyway. <laughs> It was an interesting time. Uh, the paper also had to go to review uh, internal LIGO, and it was uh, stressful in some ways, but it was exciting. In the end, it's not a prediction anymore because we did it after the rumors were out. So, um, uh, but uh, all I can say is that uh, what you naturally produce in this channel is pretty massive black holes. So the typical chirp mass is between 14 and 50. I think the chirp mass was 28, I think. Is that right? Um, merge typically between a Hubble time, that's already because they're contact now and they will shrink, so that is comes na naturally out of it. Typically comparable masses because you need both stars to go through this and they need to be massive to be unstable enough to do this. And so uh, in our simulations we get <laughs> almost too close to the uh, rates of the O1 run. So the standard model predicts 1.8 events in the, in the first 16 days. Uh, whether you believe that or not is up to you. Uh, uh, but I think it's an interesting new channel that we uh, might be able to distinguish from the others uh, someday soon. Uh, and so one of the challenges for this model potentially is uh, that these stars are pretty well spinning. And if they keep these spins and become black holes, then uh, you might predict larger spins than the particular event. But um, uh, I think it's fun to uh, discuss this channel. How far am I on time? Uh, okay. Okay, that was my way to... Uh, uh, put uh, gravitational waves in a supernova talk. Okay, I'll see how far I get with the second part. Um, let's talk a bit uh, more about progenitors, uh, but still the role of binarity. So let me simplify things a little bit. So I gave you lots of reasons why massive stars are extremely complicated, uh, but I'm going to simplify things now. I'm just going to talk about uh, supernova that either have hydrogen or have uh, uh, very little or almost no hydrogen. And so they can be stripped either by stellar winds or by a companion, and that has been known for uh, while, and evidence is only uh, strengthening for that, that, that binarity at least plays a, a fair role in the right-hand side. Uh, but so one of the questions is on the left side. Uh, we, we think of type 2 supernova as being safe, being nicely done by single stellar models, but I'm curious how many binaries are actually responsible for these. Um, so I'll, that's a cliffhanger. If I get to it, I'll answer that in the end. Um, so from our observations of the properties of binaries, we know that a large fraction will interact from our galactic survey, we estimate that seven out of 10 binaries will interact severely with the companion. And so uh, that is the distributions when for super young stars, like two million years old, maybe four million at most. And so we would love to compare that with this pie chart, for example, I stole the one from Nathan Smith, but uh, I guess we will get uh, more accurate ones are, are uh, 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 being created. Uh, and so this pie chart is how massive stars die and, and all these kind of different uh, explosions and so all these are basically stripped. That's the one C's, the one B's, and the type 2 B's. That is 32.9%. <laughs> that was 33%. Anyway, this is not the game as you want to play it because this is birth, that is death. There's a lot happening in between. This is for O stars. And a lot of the supernova come actually from early B type stars. So this is not the game you want to play, but I'm, I'm just wanting to show you we're on the right ballpark with, uh, with this stripping. But we're trying to model this for real and really try to start with this and see how they end at the end of their lives. Uh, so let's start with some uh, stellar evolutionary models briefly. This is MESA models by my, uh, one of my students, Elva, Elva Jutberg. Um, okay, I think I pronounced it correctly now. So this is a single star uh, evolved with MESA. It's a 15 solar mass star. This is a standard. How bright is a star? How hot is it? Hot on the left side. And so it's expanding. And this one will nicely produce a type 2 supernova. So let's put it in a binary system. And so we put it in a binary system with an orbit of 10 days a companion, a mass ratio of 0.8. And so what is happening? There's mass transfer. This star fills its rush lobe. And so it drops in luminosity for a while while mass is being stripped off. And the deeper layers of the star try to uh, regain equilibrium and they steal photons that are produced in the center. So for a while it's much uh, dimmer, but at some point it recovers. And at some point the entire hydrogen envelope has been stripped off, which is happening at this very top point here. And at that point it starts to contract and what we're left with is an almost pure helium star here on the left. 
And so this is exciting for many reasons beyond uh, core collapse supernova. Actually, Ilva's uh, thesis is on thinking what is the contribution of these stars to uh, ionizing photons of any sort. Uh, but it's also interesting for the type 1bc supernova, of course. These things, before they die, they still swell up a little bit. They become so-called helium giants, and then they explode, probably as a type 1b. It's very hard to get the helium off, so I'm really happy that you are classifying a lot of the 1c's as 1b's. I think you're saving the stellar models there. Uh, um, this is exciting. I think recently uh, the, the claims are now that we probably have the first detection of such a helium giant, not just a helium star. So depending on the mass, it will actually stay here or actually swell up. If it stays here, it's extremely hard to observe these things. They're bright in luminosity, but it's theorist luminosity, right? Nobody observes polymeric luminosity. You probably observe in some optical uh, color, I presume. And so then these things are very dim. Um, uh, so uh, the nice thing is that uh, if you strip stars in a binary, you strip them no matter what, almost, no matter where the companion is or what the companion is with, within limits. But just to show you, if I put it in a 15-day binary, you see that this is happening later, but that the strip star is looking very similar. And I can give you a whole sequence, 100 days, and you see these tracks almost overlap here. And so there are a few things, binaries are definitely complicated, but these things are actually very simple. You strip a star no matter what, uh, if the companion is there. But there are exceptions, but uh, I'm not making it more complicated. And so tricks like these we can use to also start uh, simulating uh, full populations, and we use a different code. It's still uh, a bit of a pain to do this with MESA, but we have different faster codes. And you pay a bit of a price for, for some of the physics assumptions, but we think we can uh, uh, start to create a statistical framework so we can compare with the large data sets that come, uh, come, uh, are coming available. And so we're hoping to learn uh, physics by looking at the distribution of these things. And so this is a challenge. If you do this for single stars, it's, it's okay to just make a grid of different masses and different uh, composition or metallicity. And if you want to do it well, you want to make a grid of different uh, sp birth spins. But this is basically what you want to do for uh, binaries. Uh, now that would make things very hard, but the good thing is not all of these parameters are equally important, but still the parameter space is large. So we need a different approach there, and that's why we cannot do it with the full physics at this very moment, but we're, we're pretty close. Um, so this is what I'm doing with one of my other students, uh, Mano Zapartas. Uh, here I'm showing you uh, a distribution uh, in uh, when do massive stars die. I could show you other properties, but this is, uh, it will be illustrative for a moment. And so at time zero, is the, there's a starburst, and about 3 million years or so, the first massive stars are dying, and about uh, 45, 50 million years, the last core collapse supernova is going off. So this is single stars. And so what's happening, the first, first single stars, there's all only single stars, the first single stars are massive enough to have strong winds, and they die as stripped supernova. And uh, less massive ones, they take longer, but they're hydrogen-rich supernova, and so they come later. And so then the question, of course, is how is binarity going to change this? in many ways, so let me show you. So, so there's many features we can look at. Um, let's, yeah, let's start with the stripped supernova. So in blue, it's looking purple here, but in blue you see the stripped supernova. And so they're all over the place. They're mixed with the, uh, the hydrogen-rich uh, supernova. And so they're basically three groups. And so the first group is basically the classic group. It's, it's partially the single stars, the massive single stars. It's also binary systems that merged and became massive and then had strong winds, and then could lose their envelope again, and similarly, mass gainers. Then there's the second group of 1BCs, and that's the typical, uh, what we think of in binaries, where one star loses its envelope, because the other one is uh, peeling it off. And then there's a third group, and that is more model dependent, this group, but there's a lot of exotic things that can happen later uh, in intermediate mass binaries that can potentially still uh, lead to core collapse supernova. But the contribution of this third channel goes up and down with, uh, with different uh, assumptions that are uncertain. Um, yeah. And so the second thing that I, I, I'm uh, curious and excited about is uh, this part. So a single star stop here after 45 million years. Binaries have a long, huge tail of things that are late or late-ish. We're not talking giga years, we're talking 50 to 200 million years. But that is a prediction that comes from binary systems. An intermediate mass binary system, say a five or six solar mass primary with maybe a four and a half solar mass companion, if they happen to merge, you get a supernova out of that, a core collapse supernova, but very late. And so that doesn't happen to every uh, star of five solar masses, just a small fraction of them, but five solar mass stars are much more common than eight solar mass stars. And so it turns out that these things still contribute significantly to it. 
Uh, and so uh, if you do this for different assumptions of the physics, it can be 20% of your total number of supernova plus or minus fairly uh, substantial error bars. Um, and some of these have very interesting interior structures. Uh, some of them have eaten the white dwarf remnant of their, uh, of their uh, primary before they explode. And so, um, but some of them may look extremely normal because maybe the star can uh, uh, um, adopt its structure. We don't have any stellar models at this moment of uh, all these uh, strange merger products here, and we're trying to produce some, uh, but it will take some time. Uh, but we can think about the rates for now, and, and I think that's very exciting. Um, so let me get back to this question, uh, just to put this story. The type two supernovas are not safe in a single stellar world. Also, the type two supernovas, the many things may have happened during their life, uh, that they still have their hydrogen envelope, they could be mergers, they could be mass gainers, and so for a large fraction of them, if you would, if you would be lucky enough to have pre-explosion images where you see a red supergiant, then that red supergiant is indeed a star that exploded probably, but it's not telling you directly what the birth mass of this is. And so uh, from these simulations, we, we try to explore the still further, further but, uh, but the majority of type two supernova should also have had severe interaction with the companion. And so is that bad or, or should we worry about this? That's, that's uh, things that I'll leave in the air until uh, the next time I'm uh, speaking here. But we're, we're investigating what this means. And so one of the interesting things would be um, uh, Stephen Smart and his collaborators have been using pre-explosion images to think about uh, are we missing supernova? So most of these pre-explosion images, they give uh, 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 pre uh, masses for the progenitors between 8 and 12 or so, and it seems to be that they're missing massive progenitors. So I'm wondering how binaries mess up this picture, but I don't have the answer yet. Uh, I'm going to leave it here and leave you with my summary. So I, I talked in two parts about this. I talked about the diversity of progenitors. I showed you a whole crazy set of things, many exotic things, like monster stars, stars of over 100 solar masses, and that's just in a local galaxy next to ours. Imagine what you have in a real starburst. This is a wimpy starburst. We call it a starburst in, in the field of, uh, in the massive star field because we don't have anything better nearby, but it's almost nothing compared to uh, what we see in a more distant universe. Uh, we've seen spinning stars that are, are extremely fast rotating. We see runaway stars, and we see things that are not exotic, namely binaries. They're everywhere, and they're close, and they will interact. And some binaries are very, are exotic, these, these contact binaries, and potentially, a more massive analog of this at lower metallicity would potentially make uh, black holes, but we'll see that. In the second part, I showed you first, uh, a few first examples of uh, the statistical framework we're trying to create to compare the statistical predictions for, for uh, how populations, including binaries, um, uh, uh, what they predict for the variety of, uh, of supernova, discuss the delay time with uh, uh, one B's, oh, sorry, um, with, uh, stripped supernova and hydrogen-rich supernova being mixed. We have a large fraction of uh, type two supernova, and so even the type, the harmless type two supernova, we should not be uh, safe and uh, think and consider them as just single stars. Uh, so I'll leave you with that. So you showed that for a wide range of orbital periods, you always are gonna end up with a 1B. So can you say something about what you need to get a type 2b or a 1c? So the, the type 2b, if you go to wider periods, you will have a little bit more of hydrogen left. Right, so how wide? Uh, in the study with Joker Kleis, we, at 1,500 days or so, we left some hydrogen. That does depend. If you really go through a common envelope, you can strip deeper again, so it's a bit complicated. But if you don't really care about uh, having 0.2 solar mass of hydrogen or not, and you would all call all, all of them stripped, then uh, that is pretty similar. Creating a type 1c is actually a different story. Uh, Sung Sil Yoon is one of the persons who has been uh, working uh, most on that. And so the 1c's, one option would be to create a very massive helium uh, object that has its own wind and that you can strip all the way and to remove all the helium. Or the lowest mass helium stars, funnily enough, they swell up so much. You saw it a little bit in the model I showed you, it became a helium giant. But if you go to two solar mass helium stars, they become huge helium giants. And so if the companion is still in the way, you can strip it off. So there's two ways to make a 1C, by winds or by a second Rorschach overflow from a helium giant. But it, would, it was very hard to make the majority 1C, so I was really excited to see the results from Mariam and, uh, and her group. Yeah. I was just curious, very naive question. How sharp is the boundary between stripped and non-stripped? I mean, why isn't there a continuum? 
Um, or if there is, why isn't so there more So there is a continuum, that? and so there can be a tiny bit of uh, hydrogen left, and certainly in the observations we see a sequence. But there is a strange thing that if a binary is, if a star is in a binary system, as long as it has over one solar mass or helium, it can have a very extended envelope and keep transferring it. And as soon as you drop below, say, 0.5, 0.3 solar mass of hydrogen, it, it, it becomes so dilute that the stellar structure solution will make it collapse and, and contract. So there is a stellar structure uh, answer to your question. Just to make a complicated picture even more complicated, um, there is the claim that um, there is a very high likelihood of triples, especially in the, these very uh, dense environments. Uh, how would you expect the third star to affect uh, the system, or, or is the system stable for long enough to go through the stages that you described if there is a companion? So we don't know the statistics well. I mean, uh, people are more or less uh, optimistic in how well we know it. These very compact systems, for example, these contact systems, uh, it's likely that all of these have a third star that uh, I think it's fairly likely that the third star is so close that if these compact binary system would merge, then that star later could come, become big enough to actually have a Norse slope overflow interaction with the third star. So the statistics are not well known, but uh, there will be a fair fraction. Um, people would quote in the order of 20%, but the data is not, uh, we will have to see what the fractions are. But it's very interesting to think about it. Maybe the dominant channel to make uh, binary black holes Making binary black holes through the normal binary channel is pretty wide systems that go through common envelope. Uh, these things could be triple systems that go through common envelope later and later make uh, double compact objects. Maybe that's the dominating channel. We're not discussing the rates for this channel at this moment, as far as I know. Inspired in part by those last comments, can you give a, a better estimate of the merger rate? How many uh, massive stars uh, and are products of mergers? What percentage? Uh, so, I, so we have been writing down uh, the results for the late supernova. So I don't know the full rates. I'll give them to you later. For the late supernova, basically all of them are, uh, are coming from mergers. And so the reason is that the primary star, the only way to really avoid merging, it, the best way to avoid merging if the first star goes supernova and takes off and, and disrupts the binary system, then you're sure they don't merge. The problem is if your primary star is only five solar masses, it's going to leave a white dwarf. It's not going anywhere. And so the second star still swells up and it will be in the way of the second star. And so, uh, uh, and the mass ratio will be so extreme that a lot of these, frac these, these things will merge. Um, okay, I can give you better uh, merger rate numbers for the high mass uh, if we uh, take a little bit more Thank time. You. Yeah.